私はヨークタウン型航空母艦のエンタープライズグレイゴーストは私が持つ数多くの異名の中の一つだこの荘園と鮮血の戦歴こそ我が使命の証これからも戦いの果てまで勝ち続けてみせる During World War II, aircraft carriers played an integral role in the war in the Pacific. None were more recognizable and critical to the war effort than the USS Enterprise. Enterprise ended up fighting in all but two major engagements in the Pacific. The second of three sister ships of the Yorktown class and the seventh US ship to carry the name Enterprise, which dates back to the Revolutionary War and is often associated with facing overwhelming odds and coming out on top. This is the origin of her nickname, Lucky E. She was laid down on July 16, 1934, and commissioned on May 12, 1938, during the whole number of CV 6. Enterprise was one of the first US ships to respond to the nation's call to war when, on December 7, 1941, and returning from Wake Island, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. That morning, Enterprise received a radio message about the attack and sailed straight for the base. Every crew member on board was ordered to help refuel and rearm. The process that usually took 24 hours was done in only seven. Oddly enough, a storm delayed her voyage home on December 6th, leaving her out of the initial strike. Lucky E, saved by a storm. Enterprise marked her first real action of the war when on December 10th, her air patrol sank the Japanese submarine I 70, making her the first American ship to sink a full sized enemy vessel after the war had been declared. In April 1942, she conducted combat air patrols for her sister ship Hornet. While、well, the latter launched B 25 Mitchell bombers to bomb Tokyo in what was known as the Doolittle Raid, which also happens to be my favorite action of the war. A month later, Enterprise was preparing extensively for the inevitable Japanese attack on Midway Island, which began on June 4th. And we all know how that ended for the Japanese. Enterprise's first wave of torpedo bombers suffered heavy losses and zero hits. Dive bombers, however, disabled the IJN carriers Akagi and Kaga. Hideyu, the only remaining Japanese carrier, launched a strike that crippled the USS Yorktown and inevitably sank her. Despite heavy aircraft losses, Enterprise remained undamaged throughout the course of the battle. On August 24, 1942, a large Japanese force was spotted headed for Guadalcanal. In the ensuing battle, aircraft from the VF 10 Grim Reapers ended up sinking the light carrier Ryujo and drove back the forces headed for Guadalcanal. Enterprise took three direct bomb hits and four near misses. She was the most heavily damaged out of all the American ships. During the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, Enterprise once again suffered heavy damage from two bomb hits, which ended up killing 44 men and wounding 75. But Enterprise kept fighting. Despite the more severe American losses, the battle went on long enough to reinforce the Guadalcanal against the next Japanese attack. The U.S. ended up losing a destroyer, the USS Porter, and the carrier, USS Hornet. With the loss of Hornet, Enterprise became the only operational U.S. carrier in the Pacific. She was the only thing standing in the way of Japanese invasion. Her crew placed a sign on the flight deck that read Enterprise vs. Japan. The Japanese had announced her sinking on three separate occasions, all of them being false. This earned her the nickname Grey Ghost. Even after being heavily damaged from the last engagement at Santa Cruz, the Big E headed to battle once more. This time with a Navy CB crew aboard, still repairing the ship as it sailed to and during combat. On her next engagement, Enterprise's planes aided in sinking the Japanese battleship Hiei, the first Japanese battleship lost during the war. With this, Enterprise had assisted in the sinking of 16 ships and damaging 8. On May 27, 1943, Enterprise was presented with a presidential unit citation by none other than Admiral Chester Nimitz, the first ever awarded to an aircraft carrier. Then, in the summer of the same year, she received an extensive refit with new anti air weapons, anti torpedo blisters, and a new coat of dazzle camouflage, as well as the two iconic sixes on her deck. From November 7th, 1943 to June 15th, 1944, Enterprise, along with the Fast Carrier Task Force, aka Task Force 58, supported many of the landings on the scattered islands of the South Pacific. I'm not going to name all of them because there were a lot. Enterprise's next big action took place on June 19, 1944, during the Battle of the Philippine Sea, also known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot, the largest air carrier battle in history. The U.S. lost 123 aircraft and had one battleship damaged. In stark contrast, the IJN had lost three carriers, 
and about 500 to 600 aircraft. In a matter of two days, Task Force 58 had destroyed 90% of the air carrier groups the Japanese had, as well as permanently crippled its navy. Her final two actions of the war were supporting the Marines during the Battle of Iwo Jima, in which she kept planes in the air around the clock, then off Okinawa where she received her last wound of the war, a kamikaze, that ended up destroying her forward elevator. Enterprise was still moored at Puget Sound Navy Yard when the Japanese surrendered on August 14, 1945. She ended the war with 20 battle stars, making her the most decorated ship of World War II. But this was not the end of Enterprise's career. Oh no, she still had a lot more work to do. As part of Operation Magic Carpet, she ferried, and this is just what I could find, about 12,630 servicemen, patients, and POWs. On her second trip to Europe, she was presented a British Admiralty pennant by the First Lord of the Admiralty, Sir Albert Alexander. It's a cool name. She is to date the first and only ship outside the Royal Navy to be awarded that Navy's highest honor. Despite many calls to preserve the ship as a permanent memorial, Enterprise was sold for scrap on July 1st, 1958. That, that should be a war crime. It's a tragic failure to maintain the United States' military heritage. <sighs> but I understand. As much as I and many others would have liked her to still be afloat, I understand. It was the fighting spirit of the men aboard, her blessed fortune, always being in the right place at the right time when they needed her the most. Her greatness surpassed simply being preserved as a museum. The author of Crossing the Line, Alvin Kernan, said it way better than I could. I couldn't bear to think of her sitting around in some backwater, being exploited in unworthy ways, invaded by hordes of tourists with no sense of her greatness. Better by far, I thought, to leave her to memory of those who had served on her while she was fully alive, vibrating under full steam at 32 knots, aircraft turning up, guns firing, healing over so sharply that the hangar deck took on water to avoid the bombs. And this is my way of preserving her story. Small page in the great book that is our proud military history. So on this Pearl Harbor day, I decided to do a video on Enterprise and as a... Uh, <clears throat> As a remembrance for Harbor, because uh, my great grandfather actually served the Navy. I still don't know his history too well, but he ended up dying at sea. So this is kind of a important event, I guess you'd say for me. So I just wanted to do something a little special, you know. But I also like to thank Trench for helping me with this small project. He helped me with uh, some of the researching some of the facts, some of the uh, trivia. Also getting some of the images and footage you see, as well as, you know, encouraging me, because he's my boy. So, thank you, Trench. You guys enjoyed the last one, I hope you enjoyed this one, and I'll probably make another one, because they're kind of fun to make. So, for now, thank you for watching, you're all fantastic, and I'll see you next episode.